I'll begin by introducing him. Professor Claude Desplan is a biologist originally trained in France. He has been a silver professor in New York University's Department of Biology since 1999. His research centers on understanding the development and functioning of the visual system that underlies color vision using the fruit fly Drosophila as a model organism. He has received several awards and honors. In 2020, he was awarded the Edwin Grant Medal by the Society of Development Biology. In 2018, he was elected as the member of National Academy of Sciences. Focusing on Drosophila, among other model organisms, this plant and his team have made significant contributions to the field of molecular biology, genetics, developmental neurobiology, and electrophysiology. They have been provided insights on body access formation, the generation of neural diversity, the molecular mechanisms involved in retinal and optic lobe development, and the neural circuits underlying motion detection. And today he's going to talk about how do eyes adapt to the visual world of animals. Over to you, Ms. Plan. Thank you very much. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully it works a bit. And so with the screen, So do you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, as Yamini has explained to you, I'm a neurobiologist, but not the same type of neurobiologist that you have heard before. Is somebody who actually cares about how the brain is built and uh, not so much about how it functions. And of course, if you know how something is built, you can figure out how it might function. And so, um, I want to tell you today how uh, focus on the eye because the eye is basically where everything starts for any sensory uh, stimulus that uh, we have heard of. And um, um, so I want to tell you about the eye and also how the eye has evolved in different species to adapt to the way those animals live. Okay? So vision is absolutely important. Any animal, even the simplest form of animal life that is, lives in, in, a, in, a, in a light as a clear uh, visual system and is able to detect light. They can detect light for finding food, for finding mates, for escaping predators, and all those animals do have uh, eyes that are very good. Okay. So, but the problem is that because eyes have evolved quite independently, you have very, very different sh eye of, of shape and form. So for example, you have the human eye, it's called a camera eye, and that is one big lens that collect light and basically project it onto your retina. Then you have the squid eye. It looks very, very similar to a human eye. The same, the single lens also is also project to the to the to the to the retina. But you, as you might understand, squids and humans are very, very <coughs> distant in the evolutionary tree. And it's kind of surprising to see they have a very similar eye. And I'm going to tell you that in fact they look the same, but they're quite different from one another. And then you have the compound eye of insects. And I'm sure if you look closely at insects, you know they're made of facets. And those facets are made of, uh, of little eye, mini eyes. And each eye here on an insect uh, is able to detect one pixel, which means the eye is not terribly high resolution because one pixel per, uh, per little facet is not much. And this little fly, which is a Trosophila, the animal that I work for, uh, is about 800 of those facets, which it has a re resolution of 800 pixels. Uh, just for comparison, our human eyes can see millions of pixels. So we can can see many thousands of times better than a fruit fly. Yet, if you try to catch a fruit fly, usually the fruit fly manages to escape and you cannot do it because uh, the fly is faster than you, okay? So going back to the, to the structure of the eye, this is an octopus eye, and it looks many similar to what you might have seen when you, have, when you took some classes about uh, when, you, when you dissect an eye, in the sense that you have, you know, you have a lens, okay? And then you have the retina here, and then you have neurons that take the information from the eye and collect it, send it to the brain, okay? As we just heard in a previous speaker. But then the human eye is built, is built in a quite a different way. In the sense that the human eye is uh, also collecting information from photoreceptor, but as you can see, the photoreceptor, actually are, which are in yellow, are hidden behind a layer of the cell that would project to the brain. So for some reason, uh, the, the, the light comes through the lens, then before it reaches the, the photoreceptor, it has to cross a bunch of neurons, which might be, uh, decrease the resolution, which is an issue that uh, the human eye has to resolve. 
And so this indicates, in fact, also they look the same from the outside. The human and octopus eyes are actually quite different in terms of how they are built. Now, eyes are very expensive organ. It's a very expensive organ because it takes a lot of energy to constantly see the world through our eyes. And therefore, when you have animal like this little fish, which is a cave fish that spent the last 200,000 years in a cave, it had to get rid of its eye because you know the eye is expensive and it could save a lot of energy and dedicate this energy to doing something else if it was to going to live in a total darkness for many, 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 many generations. So here you have two fish. You have the cave fish called Astyanax. No, sorry, you have the, the surface fish, Astyanax, which has these beautiful eyes, okay? Those are fish that live on the surface. And the little, same, exact same species, they can cross fertile between this fish and that fish. These are fish that spend the last 200,000 years in, in, the, in the cave, and as a consequence, has lost pigmentation and also has lost the eye. So just to indicate that eye is essential, it's very important, but it's also hard and expensive to maintain. And as a consequence, you want to lose it. And it's true for almost any animals that got lost in a cave. You can have shrimp, shrimps, or whatever animals that lost, get lost in a cave many, many uh, generations ago, they lose their eye. Okay. So now, uh, going back to the fact that the eyes look very different between the fruit fly eyes, for example, and the, the mouse eye or the human eye. And yet there is something very striking that we discovered uh, many years ago is that actually there are mutations in, in flies uh, that are called eyeless because when this fly is mutant for this gene eyeless, it is born without an eye. And that's a very similar mutation in mouse and in human actually, that when the mouse's mouse is born without a gene called small eye, if he has one copy loss, there's a small eye. If he has two copy loss, he's actually completely blind. There's no eye whatsoever. And the same mutation exists in human called aniridia, and uh, again, cause a loss of eyes. And the striking thing is that actually, when people managed to figure out why, what was wrong in those flies and what was wrong in this human or mice, in all three cases, they realized that it was due to the mutation in one single gene called PAC6, okay, whatever its name. And this gene actually is the same, which means this gene is required for formation of the fly eye, the human, the human eye, and the mouse eye, which again indicate at some point there was something in common because they developed the very same way. They require the same type of gene to be able to develop normally. Okay. So, in fact, this gene PAC6 is very important because if you take this gene and you, it's a gene is only expressed in the eye. But if you put it, you force expression, you force is expression that means you, you make the RNA for, for Paxic and you put it anywhere on the body, you can see now the fly will grow eyes everywhere. It will grow eyes on his legs, on his wings, on his uh, uh, antenna, everywhere. Of course, it's not very happy, not very healthy, but you can see that just expression of one gene there is going to cause the formation of all ectopic eyes. And you can do that by expressing the fly eye, but also you can do the very same thing by expressing the mouse eye or the human, the so mouse gene or the, or, the, or the human gene. I mean, if you take the human gene, of course, you're not going to grow human eyes. You're going to grow mouse uh, fly eyes because those, the circuit, the gene is a fly response by making whatever they know how to do, which is a fly eye. Okay? People have done the same experiment in mouse actually and cause ectopic expression of eyes in mouse or in frogs. Uh, they're not as good as those, but you know, it means that indeed you have some gene on top of a hierarchy that control the whole development of the eye. Okay. okay, so now, as you know, and I want to talk a bit about color vision, the, the eyes has two types of photoreceptor. In your eyes, you have two types of photoreceptor. You have what we call rods here on the left, and you have cones here on the right. And I'm sure you know the difference between rods and cones. Rods serve to live to, to see. In, in, in the evening when there is low light and uh, they are mostly giving you uh, a, a, an image in black and white, while the cones on the right side actually are smaller, they have less sensitive, they need a lot of light to function, but they also can give you color vision. In a sense that you have cones that can detect blue, red, and green, and together those three types of photoreceptor allow you to basically detect all the, the palette of color between the blue and, and the red, so basically what you can see in the rainbow. So not only can we see, it's very important, we can also see in color, okay? And seeing in color is very important because for example, it's a, it's a kind of a weird example, but you can see that if you're colorblind and maybe some of you are colorblind, I think 7% of the male population is colorblind, cannot see the difference between the red and green. And again, you can see if you don't see in color, you will see that all those papers are the same. 
But if you can see in color, you can see the red, you can see the three of them actually uh, uh, color uh, uh, papers, and therefore they're in a different type of, of, of the species, okay? So now, where does this all start? As you know, we all started in the middle of the ocean. You will start like an animal living in, in, the, in, the, in the sea. And um, uh, I want you to start a bit later when actually the fish uh, were on, on, the, on the ground. And if you ever did some diving in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in <clears throat> I don't know how far you are from the ocean, but if you do some diving in a coral reef, for example, you can see a lot of beautiful, beautiful, beautiful colors, okay? And indeed, the fish that live in this coral reef are able to detect the color because they are going to have predators of different colors, they have the mate of different colors, and they need to be able to detect them. And in order to do that, the fish have developed a beautiful retina, and the retina is this array of photoreceptors. So it's a bit like rods and cones, okay? And here I only show you cones because you have four types of cones here, which are arrayed in a very, very organized way. We have a UV sensitive cone, a blue sensitive cone, a red, and a green sensitive cone. Here's a different color. And they're very regularly spaced. Fish not only can see blue, red, and, 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 and green like us, they can also see UV because they have a larger array of, of a photoreceptor that allows them to detect things that we cannot detect ourselves. However, whenever the fish crawl out of the water during evolution and reach the land to become the land vertebrate, for example, they actually did something quite dramatic in the sense that the fish, which are tetrachromat, in the sense they can see UV, blue, green and red, when they crawl into land, they actually met a, a, a place where the dinosaur was, were ruling the world. And when you're a dinosaur, when you, you live with dinosaur, you try to escape them. And therefore you try to stay small and try to live at night. And when you live at night, as I was telling you, your roads don't function very well because your roads, your, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm confusing you. When you live in the dark, you only can use your roads and your cones don't work very well because they require a lot of light to function. As a consequence, since the animal live at night and they could not use their color vision, they lost most of their color photoreceptor. They only kept the green and the blue, maybe uh, the colors as you can see at dawn or at dusk. So what happened is that, uh, in fact, most mammals, your cat, your dog, your cow, whatever, they're all actually uh, uh, um, uh, color blind. They can only see two colors and don't see them very well. They're actually very, very few codes. So when you see, for example, a bull race in Spain, they, the, the bull sees like a cape, which is red, but it's, in fact, it doesn't see the red. So it just sees something moving in front of it. Yeah. So all, uh, 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 all mammals actually are dichromats, but something happened in the lineage that did to humans. Okay. And again, I made this, uh, this cute picture, I'm sure you know about Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve, you know, uh, Eve gave an apple to Adam to be able to get it out of the, the paradise. Again, it's just a story. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Adam, to accept the apple, needed to know that the apple was right. And therefore, uh, the, uh, the man needed to see uh, right to be able to, to do that. Of course, this is just, uh, just a, a beautiful story, but it's not reality. The reality is actually the human, where basically, gatherer, hunter gatherer, and they wanted to gather foods and, and in, you know, to, to feed. And therefore having uh, an ability to detect the red was an advantage because they could see those food, they were sweet and were basically able to eat. And therefore there was a pressure on human to be able to detect the red color. And I told you that all the other mammals don't see red at all. And so what happened, there was an event in the lineage leading to human whereby not only they have green and blue photoreceptor cells, but they also, created some red photoreceptor cell. And the typical type of evolutionary process whereby you make one gene, for example, the green, and you make two of them, and you tune one to become red. And then now you have an addition uh, type of, 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 of detection of, of the vision in, in your eye, okay? So you might <coughs> have done that, but because the way they proceed to do that, they managed to make a retina, which has a bunch of red, green, and blue photoreceptor cells. But as you can see, it's kind of a mess. You know, Santino is completely randomly distributed you have the blues that you have some red, you have some a bunch of, you have very few blue actually. You have a lot of red sometimes, sometimes you have a lot of green. It's a mess. And again, it's in sharp contrast to what I showed you earlier with the fish retina, where the fish retina actually had a lot of beautifully organized for it has four types instead of three types of photoreceptors and they're very well organized. This retina is actually stochastic, which means it's randomly distributed. Yet, you know, we can see color very well, okay? We can appreciate the beautiful painting. We can ap appreciate, you know, the, the, a lot of things that, as it comes in color. 
Okay, so again, you can see how evolutionary pressure allows a human to acquire a new color because they needed that to gather food outside, okay? And of course, if you don't have the color ability to detect red and what color blind color people are, you lose quite a lot of information. You go to the market and you try to buy some fruits. If you, this is what you see with your normal eyes, but if by chance you are color blind, which is actually a very common process, you can see that everything looks the same. It's much harder to distinguish it. And you can see the disadvantage when you have to collect those fruit in, in, the, in the wild, okay? Okay, so now fruit flies, which is much easier to study than human because you know, human, you cannot do almost anything, are also able to detect color. And the human uses these uh, this eyes of the fruit flies, which has this, uh, this uh, uh, <clears throat> compound eye made of many different facets. And in that in the facet, you have this photoreceptor, which are very similar to rows, yet which are here, or cones, which are in the middle. And the cones are interesting because they can detect, they come in two flavors. They can detect either UV light or they can detect blue light, okay? And again, you know, to be able to see light, uh, color, you need not one photoreceptor, you need at least two. You need to compare two photoreceptors to be able to, oh. detect, to see which, which wavelengths of light to detect. And so flies can see between UV and blue, but actually the funny thing is actually uh, uh, the, they contain, in fact, two types of, of uh, little facet. Some they can see between UV and blue, some they can see another type of UV and green. So if you do staining for green and blue photoreceptor cells onto this retina, what you can see is something like that. Stochastic, again, random distribution of blue and green, okay? And it's a bit similar to what you saw in the human retina. And like if you look now at the UV1 and UV2, they, oh, sorry. Uh, they, okay, so they can see this distribution of green and blue and, and, um, and that's stochastic act in the case of the human retina. So now can we see indeed whether flies or insects can see vision, can see color? And again, I have this video on the next slide which shows you an example with a butterfly. So what you have a yellow disc that contains sugar water and the uh, butterfly will land onto it and it likes the sugar water and you can see it's going to so slurp the uh, sugar water and now it's going to associate sugar with yellow color. And now you get to these uh, butterflies, no sugar water at all, but different disc of different color, yellow, red, blue, or green. And you can see very, very quickly, the butterfly will actually try to look for the yellow because it remembers, it has learned actually that the yellow is where there was some, um, um, some sugar water. And again, it's not where the disc was because you, know, you can disc change the disc of place and it will still do the yellow. And you can do the very same experiment but instead of putting the sugar water onto the yellow, you can do it on a different thing. You can do it on a different color. For example, here, the, the, the animal was trained to, to a different color and you can see that it happened. Okay, so, okay. so insect can see color vision and it can be very useful to be able, for example, to recognize flowers for butterflies is very important and also to recognize mates because you know uh, butterflies live together and if they want to mate with the right species, they have to collect the, the right uh, color, okay? So now I want to go back to this uh, uh, stochastic distribution, this random distribution of photoreceptor, the so blue and green. And as I told you, this is uh, very strange because why is it so random like we see in the human retina? But in fact, most insects, including the, 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 the butterfly's retina does contain random distribution of photoreceptor. But we found a species of flies, very related flies, with, uh, so this is like the butterflies, it is also random distribution of photoreceptor. You don't have two types, there are three types of photoreceptor, which allows it to expand this color vision because uh, butterflies do rely extensively on color vision for the life. Fruit flies do less. So, okay. so the flies is basically uh, exceeding UV, blue, and green, and the butterflies have very complex retina, and you can see five colors. It's pentachromat, much more than even the fish. You can see a lot of colors, again, because it has to recognize all of the flowers. So again, this is actually what you see in the flies. You can see a random distribution of blue and green and random distribution of the UV1 and UV2, again, which are stochastic distribution. And again, this still allows the fly to see in color. Okay. Now, again, this distribution, which is stochastic, is found in flies, is found in butterflies, is found in almost every insect in the world. But we discovered a flies, which is related to our fruit flies, which doesn't look stochastic. It's called Dolicopodidae. It's a, it's a carnivorous fly that you see on your bushes sometimes. I'm sure they exist in India. And if you look on the outside, you can see that they have these beautiful stripes of color yellow and red and yellow color. And they're almost perfect, very beautiful. There is a mistake maybe here. And if you look again at the distribution of the green and blue photoreceptor cells, you see in the fruit flies, 
they are randomly distributed. But in this Dolichopodidae flies, they are beautifully arranged into very, very regular array. So we ask the question, why nature choose to be stochastic or choose to be deterministic, to be very regular like that? And I must tell you that we don't exactly know what the answer to this question is, okay? So again, you can see there is a lot of variation here on the, <clears throat> on the, the, the oops, sorry, something went wrong. <coughs> okay, so you have a lot of distribution of, of a visual system, some stochastic, some deterministic. But as you will see, there is actually quite a wider array of distribution here. And for example, exactly the, 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 the horse flies or deer flies is a fly that land on you and exactly the female, and the female is going to cut with this kind of knife here, make you bleed, suck up your blood. And why does she do that? She does this because she needs a lot of food for being able to make eggs. And she's very prolific, she needs to make a lot of eggs. So she cuts you and eat your blood to be able to make eggs. And of course, only female make eggs, which means the males don't have a this little knife. In fact, the males don't care about feeding because the males have only one purpose in life, is to find the female to mate, to give the sperm, and then to die. And therefore males, which I'll show you in the next picture, are actually uh, 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 very interesting. They don't have something to feed, and their purpose being to find the female, they need to be able to try to chase the female. But the female, as you might know in, in, in nature, are kind of the choosy because they have a very heavy metabolic load. They need to make eggs. And they want to make sure their eggs are going to produce babies, which are going to be very fit. And therefore, they want to choose males that are going to be the fittest possible. And therefore, the male is going to have to display that it's very fit, it's going to give rise to beautiful eggs, and therefore, the female will be able to choose this type of male. And so in this species, the way the female choose a male is because she's going to try to escape the males by a very complex type of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of flying, and you can see here, this flight is going to fly, and then the male will try to catch her, and only those males that can catch her will be able to mate and to give the sperm. But the male, of course, since they are only one purpose in life is to give the sperm, will have adapted to this situation, and therefore will have an eye, which is very good at being able to track the female in flight and to be able to catch the female and give the sperm. And then you will see the male is developed what we call a love spot, which is a spot on the eye, which is only dedicated to tra tracking the female to be able to catch her. And I think on the next picture, you can see what I mean by lost spot is pretty not subtle. This is a female and a male of the same species. The female has actually this uh, knife here, which the male doesn't have. But then the male has this huge eyes here, which is dedicated just for finding the female. Again, it always finds, uh, tracks the female from down below and from the back, which means this is a part of the eye they see the female. And you can see here as it develops this love spot, it allows it to catch up the, the female. And so you can see again, you adapt your eyes, you adapt your visual system, you adapt your brain to the specific circumstance of what's going to happen. Now you can ask you the question, why does a female have these beautiful stripes? It's very simple because the female wants to indicate which species she belongs to. And therefore the male, which used to have the stripes here, but they are being squeezed by the love spot, the female, the male will know this is a female from one species and will chase her and not other female. Okay, in other species, for example, this one is a, a, a uh, so another species, and it has a different pattern on the eyes. Again, this huge big knife to cut to make you bleed. And the male also has a love spot. And again, the love spot now is able to allow it to detect this type of female. That means the most extreme case actually is the mayflies. Mayflies are not exactly flies. They're flies are very, very prolific. They're called ephemerid. And again, this is a female eye, which is like uh, the, the boring eye that you see in the other female. And look at what happened in the males. So the male is not only the same as a female eye, it has also added this huge kind of telescopic eye on top of this huge thing. And again, because the only purpose of this male is to find the female. And what this is basically a telescope, it's a tele lens that allows the uh, female to be on the, the male to be on the ground and to see that there are a bunch of females flying around. It's going to focus attention on one of the female and go to chase her and try to mate with her. And you can see how much this, uh, uh, this flight dedicated is, is, uh, is, uh, is a patterning system, is eye to just one purpose, catching the female, gives a sperm, and then die. Again. In fact, pattern on the eye are something fascinating. And again, you have this flight, which is this beautiful pattern. And for those who know the map of the US, you might recognize the, the, the shape of Texas. I don't think it means anything, but uh, uh, okay. And then you have those which has this polka dot here, 
beautiful polka dot, okay? And then you have the flies, like this one, which has a huge eye. It's actually a killer fly. The flies that these big eyes that cause horsing because this fly is going to catch all the flies or other insects and eat them. And therefore, she needs a big eyes to be able to do that. Or you have this beautifully refined pattern that you see in those other type of flies, male and female, exact same pattern in this case, but the, uh, the, the, the evolution has drawn this amazingly beautiful uh, picture onto the, the surface of the eye. I don't know how the purpose of that is, and I don't know how nature has managed to do that. Okay. So anyway, uh, I want just to thank you for that, to listen to me. And again, I got a lot of help with this talk by having colleagues of mine, which are not scientists. They are just uh, uh, people who live and just love to love the insect. And they take a lot of picture and we change this picture. Keith Short is in Chicago. Nusef Arabshi is actually a beautiful photographer in, 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 in Abu Dhabi, in the UAE. And we exchange, we see, we talk to each other because they collect information in the wild and we try to understand what the observation means. So I'm going to stop here.